Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Grand Rounds uh, today. Uh, I'm Tom Farden, and I'm uh, one of the chairs of Grand Rounds. And it is, uh, I'm very pleased to introduce today Professor John Dillon, who is Professor of Gastroenterology and Hepatology here in NHS Tayside. And you'll have seen, hopefully, from my email introduction that I sent yesterday, that uh, it, John really is an international expert in the, uh, the area of hepatology having chaired a, a whole list of guideline committees and and, uh, um, and is a well-respected and sought after international speaker on the uh, in the field of, of hepatology. He's been to Grand Rounds before. Um, he spoke a few, couple of years ago now about hepatitis C and um, the aim to make uh, Tayside and Dundee into a, the first hepatitis C free city in the world. And he may mention that and, uh, at some point, but that, uh, that, uh, that uh, dream has come to fruition. And then more recently, he spoke about ILFTs, which have become an award-winning uh, system of, uh, of intelligent LFT testing for primary care, um, uh, improving the pathway of people with liver disease. So um, uh, I've known John a long time. He actually interviewed me for my consultant job. He probably just about remember that from the dim dist and distant path, at which time I thought he was uh, incredibly intimidating and scary. And now he's he's uh, he's a colleague and still intimidating and scary. So um, he's uh, he's going to talk today about dying for a drink, drug induced liver injury. Uh, any questions, please put them in the chat along on the side and we'll deal with those at the end. Um, thanks so much, John. Thank you, Tom, for that introduction. I hadn't realised I was still intimidating you and scaring you. I'll have to make better use of that when I want something out of you. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation to come and speak. Um, today is a little bit of a polemic. I'm on a soapbox and um, uh, grumping about things. So we're going to talk about drug-induced liver injury. I want you to imagine that you are now members of the MHRA on drug safety. You have two drugs in front of you. One is a PPAR alpha and gamma agonist that's used as anti-diabetic drug and has a one in 10,000 risk of idiosyncratic drug induced liver injury leading to acute liver failure. The alternative drug is an anxiolytic sedative and euphoriant uh, used as an inhibitor of preterm labor, is a dose dependent toxin to the liver, is toxic in the therapeutic range and is also a well described carcinogen. Which drug do you want to ban? Now we have a show of hands if we were doing this on a real uh, lecture theatre, but clearly you can't be here. In reality, in 1997, the MHRA banned triglitazone, which is drug A, because of that risk factor. Drug B is, of course, alcohol, ethanol, and it's not officially a drug, although it is it was used for preterm labour um, back in the 80s when I was training as a junior doctor, and it's still used widely, yet it is lethal to us and we are continuing to take it in large quantities. So today I want to talk to you about um, minimum unit pricing and how Scotland is leading the world around that. I want to talk to you about safe drinking levels and whether there are such things. And at the end, I want to touch on changes in liver disease, particularly alcohol related liver disease and its treatment. So those three things, and it's a bit of a sort of a leap and a jump through all of those topics. So let's look at male related alcohol deaths by age group in England. So um, the light color is wholly attributable to alcohol. The orange color is partially attributable to acute consequences. And the green color is partially attributable to chronic conditions. And then the percentage line, the red line, is the percentage of deaths at each age group. So you can see um, at the percentage, the numbers of deaths in each age group on the left hand side of the graph. So in the 45 to 64 year old groups, you're seeing over 2000 deaths per year from those things. And that accounts for about 15% of all deaths in that age group. And falling as the numbers of deaths go up, as you get old, as one gets older, the proportion that alcohol contributes falls away. But in terms of that under 65 group, in those taxpayers, people who are working, etc., alcohol makes a disproportionate contribution to deaths. It has a huge impact. And it is probably one of the most modifiable risk factors we have for early deaths. And if you look at what's causing that, it's alcohol related liver disease. And from um, 1989, 1991, when I started training as a hepatologist, 
it was relatively unusual and we've seen a doubling over the next decade. I don't think I was personally responsible for driving that death rate in liver disease, but that was the big surge that we saw over that time frame as alcohol became more affordable and was driving forward that huge numbers of deaths. And so you're looking at 20 to 25 per 100,000 uh, during that time frame. If you compare that to other diseases and you take everything back to a standardization of 1970 and see how death rate age normalized death rates of standardized death rates have changed since the 1970s almost all diseases including respiratory disease have fallen away so tom and his colleagues despite being fearful of me are doing very well at bringing down the death rates from their disease we as hepatologists are failing abysmally and things were surging away till 2006 2007 with an over 500% increase in the rate of liver disease in the under 65s, okay? So age normalized for that naught to 65s. So a huge increase in the amount of deaths. You'll see in the area highlighted by the green bar, things started to fall. And that was at the same time as the, as the great cra economic crash where relative earnings went down and the cost of everything went up slightly, including alcohol. And it brought the rate of increase and rate of deaths down so there's a relationship between death rate and the cost of alcohol and many of you will be aware of these newspaper headlines this one from um, 2006 just before the crash where our booze is cheaper than water so a can of tenants would cost you 37 pence at that time and uh, a bottle a plastic bottle of water would cost you 59 pence and so it really was uh, cheaper than water and if you look at the relative cost between 1997 and 2006, tenants lager relatively was £1.36 in 1976 and was 37 pence in 2006. Uh, and a bottle of uh, vodka was nearly £30 and had fallen in relative value to just under £12. And so alcohol had become much, much more affordable by that 2006 time frame. And what else had happened? You know, where was the alcohol being moved from and there was a shift of distribution so in 1994 51% of our, the alcohol drunk in Scotland was consumed in a bar and 49% was bought in the off trade by 2016 that's changed dramatically with only 27% of um, alcohol being bought in a bar and 73% now being bought for consumption at home in the off sales and that's probably to do with price as those of you who have recently drunk in a pub will know the relative price of alcohol from an affordability point of view has stayed much the same and the prices have increased with everything else. Whereas um, in supermarkets up to 2016, the price had fallen dramatically. And if you look at clinic patients, people who have liver disease and are attending hospital or clinics, 88% of them will buy their alcohol in off sales and only 12% of them are drinking in bars. And of the heaviest 25% of drinkers that are seen in clinic, it's a 97, 3% split. So it shows how cost sensitive those people who are drinking most heavily are. And so cost is a big determinant of how much you drink. And certainly um, if you want to know where the cheapest alcohol is in Tayside, come to Ward 2 and chat to one or two of my patients and they'll be able to tell you. If you look at per capita consumption, uh, this is litres of alcohol per head since 2000, uh, since 1900s through to 2010, you can see that there was a very high level in the early Victorian Edwardian age, which fell sharply in 2014 due to the introduction of licensing laws and duty on alcohol went up dramatically, all part of keeping people um, at work. And so pubs shut in the afternoon for the first time and that allowed people to get back to work after their drinking. And you can see that consumption has changed over time as beer drinking has fallen slightly, cider drinking has become more popular, wine drinking has increased substantially and spirits have also um, increased. And these uh, ready to drink cocktail type fruit drinks have made a substantial, these uh, alco pops have made a substantial increase in recent levels. But if you think of that, that's nine to 10 liters of alcohol per head that doesn't really bring it home, does it? If you think of it in a Scottish perspective, Scotland is drinking about um, 11 litres of alcohol per head. We're doing more than England and Wales. That's equivalent to 43 bottles of spirit 
per person for every person in Scotland per year. And it's estimated that 10% of the alcohol consumed in Scotland, no duty is paid on. It's uh, imported from duty free or other sources from Europe or is brewed illegally in Scotland. So there's no duty paid on it or brewed legally for personal consumption. And if you then add to the idea that most people are going to spend two, two weeks of the year out of the country on a sunny holiday somewhere in those days before COVID, that brings you up to 50 odd bottles per year. Add into that that about 15% of the Scottish population drink virtually nothing, then we are consuming a huge amount of alcohol. And I assume that the people in this audience are not drinking in excess of a bottle of vodka a week, and therefore someone is drinking your vodka. And it brings home quite how much is being consumed. Coming back to that idea between cost and um, consumption. So if you look at the blue line, this is the amount of, ta of the, the percentage that alcohol duty contributes to total tax. So you can see back in 1981, it was about 90, the early 1980s, it went up to just over 4% of the total tax burden was retrieved from alcohol. And this has fallen substantially over time with one or two little excursions from different. So it's making much less of a contribution. And as that relative affordability has come down because duty has come down, we've seen deaths going up in proportion. And in terms of the costs to that, the grey bars on this graph show you that it's about nine billion pounds a year. We are now losing in that lost tax because of the reduction in alcohol duty. And so we're having the increased health burdens of alcohol related liver disease and this fall in uh, tax revenue as well to pay for it. So if you think about the public health policy here, there are two competing views of it. You've got the industry paradigm, which view alcohol as normal and problems arise when a minority of people misuse it, i.e. it's somebody else's fault and they spoil it for the rest of us. And therefore the solution is to change the behavior of the minority who have a problem and let the rest of us get on with it. The public health approach is alcohol is not an ordinary product. It's addictive, it is, pervasive throughout our society and the problem is not with the individual but with the product and its impact on society. Therefore the solution is to make the environment less pro-alcohol, to move away from this idea that all of our social interactions have to occur around alcohol and reduce the population consumption. And the maximum health gain is gained through that shifting of the consumption curve to the left and making it everyone's problem rather than focusing on a small number of people who are having excessive problems. And that's the dilemma in the public health policy argument that has gone on in Scotland for the last two decades. It's not a new problem. I take you back to the general election of 1922. The sitting MP was the war hero, former government minister, Winston Churchill, um, who you can see here with his medals of, uh, across his chest. Um, and he was the sitting liberal, Dem liberal uh, MP. And he was voted out by the Prohibition Party, which you know, in Dundee in 1922, they got 32,000 32, votes and managed to remove Winston Churchill. Not sure what happened to Winston Churchill after that, after Dundee rejected him. But it shows that the issue with alcohol has been one that's gone on for years. And I take you even further back to the um, code of Harun Rabi, who was a king of ancient Babylon, and in 1700 BC wrote the laws of uh, Babylon down on this stone and law 108 was if a, cav a tavern keeper takes money and the price of the drink is less than that of the corn used to make it, she shall be convicted and thrown into the water. So even in ancient Babylon, they realized the important of, importance of price for alcohol and fair dealings and the concept of minimum unit pricing. So the idea behind minimum unit pricing is that by raising the price of the cheapest alcohols available, you will reduce consumption by those most at risk of the consequences of excessive alcohol. And in, 19, in um, 2012, after work done by Sheffield University, 50%, 50 pence per unit was advocated as the optimum, pro, optimum minimum unit price to bring it forward. And Nicola Sturgeon, who was then the Cabinet Secretary for Health, steered this bill through the Scottish Parliament and got it made into law. The first country in the world to have this minimum unit pricing concept 
focused on the public health intervention to reduce alcohol consumption by increasing the price of the cheapest alcohol. The Scotch Whiskey, Whiskey Association challenged this minimum unit price. It's interesting it was a Scotch Whiskey Association because, of course, Scotland is very fond of its association and the value of its trade from whisky. There is not a single bottle of whisky sold in Scotland that is affected by minimum unit pricing. There never has been and there never will be. The Scotch Whisky Association is actually owned by Diageo, more or less, and Diageo are the largest producers of cheap white alcohol, i.e. vodka and gin before flavouring in the whole of the UK. And that's their, that was their interest. They knew that it was going to affect their vodka sales and their vodka market. So they took the act to the Court of Session. They failed. They appealed to the European Court of Justice. They failed. They appealed then to the UK Supreme Court and it was unanimously rejected. And six years later, several thousand deaths later, the law came into place. And what happened when that happened? So we have a natural experiment now. We have England compared to Scotland. And you can see in England, if the, the red line was pre-introduction of minimum unit pricing, and then the green line is what happened afterwards, and the dotted lines are 95% confidence intervals, and the, um, dot, the dashed line is the um, impact of, um, is the uh, average is the median average over time in England not much change stayed within the confidence interval intervals that you would expect and in Scotland we saw with the introduction in 2018 a substantial drop and then with Covid we've seen a rise you just can't get away without mentioning Covid and I'll come back to that later so minimum unit pricing in the natural experiment we've conducted in Scotland works it's about to be launched in the Republic of Ireland. It's being put forward for um, use in Wales. Um, unfortunately, England are still lagging behind us in this great example of public health intervention. So moving away from minimum unit pricing and coming on to government drinking limits. Um, a brief history of the drinking limits. So the Royal College of Psychiatrists first put forward some drinking unit uh, safety advice in 1979 and they recommended eight units a day, a unit being um, 10 mils or eight grams of alcohol, of, yeah, 10 mils or eight grams of alcohol. The Health Education Council in 1984 uh, advocated safe drinking limits of around 18 units a week for men and nine units for women, and suggested that too much alcohol was around 56 units a week for men and 35 units for women. And then in 1987, these limits were adopted by the government and changed slightly to sensible drinking units of 21 units a week and 14 units for women, and too much was 36 and 22. And then in 1995, the government on its own brought in sens sensible drinking limits without repudiating the previous limits, suggesting three to four units per day, which of course sums up to 28 units per week, so a slight increase, and two to three for women, which was also then an increase as well. And so we had two sets of limits, which was confusing. Why do we have this confusion about the safe drinking limits? Well, it's because they were entirely made up. It was gobsack. Good old boys and girls sat around the table who plucked numbers out of the air as to what they thought might be sensible. And there's no more science behind it than that. So in 1990, in 2010 to 2012, the House of Commons Science and Technology Committee decided to science alcohol linking, alcohol um, drinking limits. And because there was increasing evidence of a link between alcohol and cancer, there was doubts cast on the cardioprotective effects of moderate drinking. And they also decided that 1995 was a long time ago and they should really interfere in the whole process again. This is the sort of famous hockey stick about alcohol consumption, that around the 15 units per week level, your, um, your risk of death starts to go up, but below that level, you have some protective benefits. Now, this is compared to the general population, so it's about the whole population, and people who are not drinking at all, many of them have reasons for not drinking because of ill health, because they're not able to get out, because it interferes with medication they're taking. And so their death rates aren't normal. And so it's a biased comparison. And this may be spurious. 
and the limit, if it is a transition point, appears to be around this 14, 15 uh, le you, uh, level, around that level of, of consumption. And so this is now where the idea is around what we should be thinking about. So trying to move that forward. That risk depends on your age because different diseases that are caused by alcohol affect you differently at different ages. And it also depends on your drinking pattern. If you're drinking, the guidelines are suggesting drinking small amounts regularly through the week, um, which still leave you if you drink excessively of uh, cirrhosis, the cardiomyopathies, the peripheral neuropathies associated with it, and the psychosocial harms, as opposed to binge drinking, where you have the consequences of violence, accidents, sexually transmitted diseases, and other sexual mishaps that might go with the consequences of being acutely drunk. And the public's perception of the problems around alcohol are very focused on the binge drinking, trouble in the streets type aspect of it, rather than the regular drinking side of things where we just think that's acceptable and a part of society. But it makes a difference to your health as well. So if you look at this study um, from the BMJ, asking people about the numbers of bottles of beer they drink per session. So the white bars are the, are the standard where you drink less than three when you have a drinking episode, you drink less than three bottles of beer, and that's the standard. And if you're drinking three to five or greater than six, so if you're drinking greater than six in a session, your alcohol mortality goes up by a factor of three. And that's driven predominantly by death from external sources, so accidents, um, death from cardiovascular disease. And in reality, that death from cardiovascular disease is um, driven by acute myocardial infarction. It seems to have acute fatal myocardial infarction where it has a substantial effect, a much lesser effect on acute myocardial infarction that's not fatal, and an acute effect on stroke driving up uh, hemorrhagic stroke as a cause of death. So the pattern of drinking starts to become important as well as the average volume of your drinking and your age as it kicks in again. This is a list of the potential diseases that have direct causality from alcohol or contributing causality from alcohol. Um, clearly, alcohol-related liver disease has a huge impact from alcohol and is caused uh, entirely by alcohol and is a big effect. But non-alcohol or cirrhosis of the liver excluding alcoholic liver disease also carries a risk. So all of those patients with non-alcoholic fatty liver disease who drink within below government limits have an excessive risk of developing liver disease. So there's a synergy between metabolic liver disease and alcohol. And you've got the cancers, chronic pancreatitis, tuberculosis, laryngeal cancers, um, breast cancer in particular, and colon cancer. Although the additive effect of alcohol is relatively minor because these two diseases are very common, they have a, that has a huge pop impact on the population. Um, ischemic heart disease, there is a slight protective effect probably. Um, ischemic stroke, there is a protective effect, but there's an increased effect from hemorrhagic stroke. So overall, when you look at all of those effects at the different ages and the model it all, I'm afraid for men, there is no protective benefit from alcohol at any age and that we should be avoiding it. For women, there is probably a slight protective benefit. However, the protective benefit appears in the 40s and disappears in the 60s. And you can gain all of that benefit by a single glass of red wine a week. In the younger age groups, the risks are uh, the benefits of alcohol are outweighed by the increased risk of breast cancer. And in older age groups, it's breast cancer again and colorectal cancer and ischemic stroke. And so those benefits are very marginal, if at all. And if you look at the global burden of disease in total from this study in the Lancet, there was no benefit across the whole country, across the, across the globe that they could see. If you look at the next graph. It was in terms of standard daily drinks, if you looked at the way of that working on a daily basis, there is no benefit. And you know, that's one drink, so you have to be drinking less than one drink a day to have any benefit from alcohol. So it really is a very, very minimal benefit and probably only for women and only in that tight age group. So the story about there being some benefit from alcohol is dead in the water. So what did the government do with this exercise? So they launched the um, guidelines and have you seen anything else about them? No, other than the publicity around them, nothing else has happened. They've set the guidelines at 
15 units, uh, less than 15 units a, a week. And that's the level at which your mortality from alcohol crosses the 1% level. Below, 50, i.e. 14 and lower, you have less than a 1% chance of dying for, as a consequence of an alcohol-caused disease. And if it's 15 and above, you have more than a 1% chance of dying of an alcohol-related liver disease. And the more you drink and the more you binge, the greater that risk, depending on the different causes of death. But the government has walked away from trying to publicise that message any further, partly because of pressure from the Portman Group and the Scotch Whiskey Association and other groupings. Let's start to turn now towards um, uh, liver disease itself and the different causes of liver disease. Now, the, um, we have a Glasgow Coma Score, we have a Glasgow Alcoholic Scale and uh, Alcoholic Hepatitis Scale, and we also have the Glasgow Alcohol Scale. So the, uh, this was done on two occasions and came up with slightly different names for it. They're rather like the Eskimos, who I'm told have 20 names for snow because they see so much of it. And we up here in Glasgow and Scotland to have well over 20 names for the various states of alcohol intoxication. And it's interesting that the final one on the list and the most extreme level of alcohol into intoxication is appropriately called mortal. And indeed, if you drink that much, you really are mortal. So in many ways, the hepatologist being a lonely sort of character, trying to protect the liver from the dousing in alcohol that it all achieves. When I started going to hepatology in the 1980s, um, I've now been a consultant hepatologist here for 25 years and training in hepatology for over 30 years. I could name every hepatologist in the United Kingdom. Now I probably can't name every hepatologist in Scotland because there are now so many of us. And that's because of that 500% increase in the liver disease that we're seeing during my career, which has been caused in part by increased diagnosis, but the vast majority of it has alcohol-related liver disease and latterly some metabolic associated, associated fatty liver disease. If, you, if I could take you back to the liver wards of the late 1980s and early 1990s, we had a 50% 30-day mortality for variceal hemorrhage. We had a 50% 30-day mortality for alcoholic hepatitis, the two commonest problems that we saw coming into liver disease, into our wards. We had, for those with the complications of chronic liver disease, like encephalopathy and uh, ascites, they had much better 30-day survival if we'd get most of those patients out of hospital. They'd be back in in the not-too-distant future, and most of them wouldn't survive two years. So it was a grim business. In that time, we've changed those mortality rates to the day where your chances of dying of a variceal hemorrhage alone in hospital are virtually zero. Your overall mortality from variceal hemorrhage, including death from liver failure afterwards in 30 days, is now down to 16%. Your chances of death from alcoholic hepatitis are down to the same order of magnitude, between 10 and 16%, depending on severity. So we've made huge strides in reducing those death rates. And I'd like to talk about some of the things that have helped that happen. The NCPOD investigation into alcohol-related liver disease um, in 2013 was truly shocking readings. Only 45% of patients who died received good care. Avoidable deaths were being identified within this uh, inquiry and it recommended the introduction of a toolkit for patients admitted with alcohol-related liver disease. If you looked at the survey in detail, if you were admitted to hospital with an alcohol-related liver disease and were seen by somebody within the first 24 hours of admission in that hospital who said, who self-identified as having an interest in liver disease, it halved your mortality in that hospital compared to a hospital without someone who had that interest. So there was a huge benefit in terms of that early intervention. And there are still in many hospitals across the United Kingdom and many in Scotland that don't have anyone who puts up their hand and says, I have an interest in liver disease, despite the frequency with which it's admitted to hospital. So the British Society of Gastroenterology and the British Association for the Study of the Liver developed the decompensated cirrhosis care bundle the first 24 hours. Uh, Jackie Patterson, when she was a registrar here, uh, introduce this onto our acute medical admissions unit and Jackie clearly as a, in that role continues to be very supportive of this. So it's a simple two-page sheet 
that requires filling in on admission and guides people through what needs to be done and fixed during the first 24 hours. This works well, it's very widely used. Audits uh, of the follow-up show that it's extensively used and works very well. There are a few things I just want to go through and pick on. I think it's a, the idea of the concept around alcohol-related liver disease. Most people with alcohol-related liver disease will get simple steatosis and never get anything more. It's only about 20% of people who drink excessively that will go on and develop um, cirrhosis of the liver and scarring. So the majority of the population will stay at steatosis and most of those won't get admitted to hospital. There is the storm of alcoholic hepatitis, which after prolonged alcohol drinking, there is a sudden trigger to an acute jaundice liver failure illness, probably driven by an infection, an infection triggered cytokine storm um, that turns on the whole inflammatory process within the liver and has a very high 30 day mortality. You notice the patients because they're jaundiced with high bilirubins and a prolonged prothrombin time and a slightly elevated ALT. So the hepatitis is, often, is usually very mild and if they have a high ALT level, it's usually not caused by alcoholic hepatitis. Associated with malaise, nausea, hepatomegaly, fever, appearance of jaundice, driven by sepsis, encephalopathies and the ascites are common and renal failure is a uh, serious complication of this syndrome and often leads to death. And so at the steatosis end of it, we can find the alcoholic hepatitis uh, incidentally, and but the more severe clinical presentation is a more severe outcome. What have we done about alcoholic hepatitis? We've been unclear how best to treat it. And uh, certainly in the noughties and early 20 teenies, we had a dilemma whether we should be treating these patients with prednisolone or pentoxifiline to try and dampen down that inflammatory response. Uh, NIMOS was part of the STOPPER study, which showed that pentoxifiline didn't do anything for alcoholic hepatitis, and there was a marginal early benefit for the use of prednisolone. Um, but it also showed us that all of our prognostic measures for alcoholic hepatitis actually were no longer accurate because we got better at looking after um, poorly poor, poor, poor outcome, poor predicted outcome patients. So those patients that we would have predicted would have done badly with prednisolone actually did much better with placebo than we would have expected in the trial. So again, that doing all of the small, simple things well and paying attention to the details of these patients has improved their overall outcome. And there is a small additional short term benefit from the use of prednisolone. Based on the data from that trial led by Ewan Forrest in um, Glasgow, along with data from nine wells, we looked at the neutrophil lymphocyte ratio to identify groups of patients that might benefit and wouldn't. And if your NLR was less than five, you did very well and tended not to need steroids. If you were between five and eight, you benefited significantly from steroids and it improved your outcome. But if your NLR was greater than eight, then it seemed to have no benefit and you had a very poor prognosis. So there's an idea of sort of inflammatory exhaustion syndrome where the whole body is failing because the inflammatory process has gone too, too far on. Which has given us this arisen, led to the arising of a new concept within liver failure. Liver failure and chronic liver disease when it's presenting to us at the front door is really two kinds. There is those patients that are, have run out of liver. They have slowly reached the end of their liver reserve and they are in liver failure because they have no more hepatocytes left. Um, and they tend to have very low albumin, their prothrombin time will be up and their bilirubin will be moderately up. But they'll look relatively well and stable in bed. And then in contrast, you've got patients with acute on chronic liver failure where they have acutely decompensated. They will be much more jaundiced. Their inflammatory markers will be hugely elevated. Their short term mortality is poorer, but their longer term mortality and their ability to regenerate is greater if you can carry them over the decompensating event. Now, for the majority of our patients, that decompensating event is alcoholic hepatitis, but for some of them, it's a variceal bleed, or for some of them, it's an infective episode that provokes this acute decompensation. And we're getting better at dividing this up, and so there are going to be scales where you have. Um, uh, Acute, acute liver failure, acute and chronic liver failure scales, which will predict outcome. 
and it is hopeful, hoped for that the oncoming trials that we have for a host of chemokines and cytokine antagonists and blockers uh, and our own sets of MABs that we will um, be able to manipulate these patients with acute on chronic liver failure and improve their outcomes dramatically um, according to these scales. So we haven't agreed what they all are yet, but this is an area of dynamic change. And over the next five years, you're going to see at least seven drugs come into clinical trials, um, looking at ways of manipulating that. And we hope to be involved in some of those trials. If we go back in time to the early late 1980s and early 90s, when I was starting to learn my trade, we saw a lot of varicell hemorrhage and we saw lots of patients bleed to death um, from varicell hemorrhage. And many of you will have memories or heard war stories about those bleeds. Um, back in that time, we had shunt surgery, which we'd largely given up doing because everybody died. We were doing esophageal, surgical esophageal transections where we'd cut the esophagus and then stitch it back together again or staple the esophagus together to disrupt the blood vessels and stop the bleeding. And occasionally some of those patients survived, but it was a rarity. And in the late 1980s, early 90s, we introduced endoscopic sclerosant, where we started in injecting sclerosant into the varices, and that stopped bleeding in 85, 90% of the cases, which was a great step forward. Endoscopic banding then appeared in the early 90s, and we started doing that, and it was as effective as sclerosant, but without the ulceration and scarring. And then again, in the early 90s, we were able to start doing TIPS, these banding and TIPS procedures are now standard. They're available here in nine wells. And it's moved us to the point where back in the 80s and 90s, it would be not uncommon for people to bleed to death. And that's now an extremely rare mode of death. So the, the days when people pebble dash walls and you see people's shadows on the wall from where people have bled on them um, have now stopped, thankfully. Because this bleeding is a downward vicious spiral, we haven't broken the spiral completely. And if we don't intervene early enough, people still die of liver failure days later. But if we can stop the bleeding early enough, we prevent that downward spiral and the survival rates of bleeds have improved dramatically. So now, um, whereas before in the early late 80s, early 90s, we would lose 50% of patients on their first varicell bleed, we would now expect to lose only 10% of our patients on their ble on our bleed. So that's a real step forward. Having moved from bleeding to thromboprophylaxis, um, it was thought um, that we that patients with liver disease were autocoagulated and therefore didn't need thromboprophylaxis and it wasn't a problem. We then had data from a multi-regional audit of blood component use, which discovered that 3% of patients who were um, transfused and needed blood components for their bleeding died of thrombotic events. Um, and this was a, and so advanced cirrhosis is associated with a state of hypercoagulability. It's an unbalanced, it's a, it's a balanced um, defect in both directions. And despite prothrombin time, despite prolonged prothrombin time, cirrhotics form clots normally when their platelet count is greater than 50. And so we're now recommending all patients who aren't actively bleeding when they admitted to hospital with cirrhosis receive um, thromboprophylaxis. And the problem behind this... A word this, about bleeding in patients with cirrhosis. We measure the prothrombin time as a marker of liver function, which measures the clotting factor. Sorry about that. I think that's a, a student lecture. I put a slide in with um, the uh, from one of my student lectures that I was just going to show you. Basically, what I was going to say was that the if you think we measure the procoagulant um, factors from the liver that cause us to clot, and that's the prothrombin time that prolongs, but the liver also makes protein C, protein S, and antithrombin 3, which are the anti-clotting factors, and the defect is balanced, and so both of them are reduced, and so most people don't um, clot or clot normally, provided they're not pushed in the seesaw either way, and so, but so while it is easy to bleed, it's also easily to clot. So you move backwards and forwards. So patients who have recently bled are equally prone to suddenly clotting. Finally, um, coming towards COVID, um, this is data from England from 2020 um, that's just been published. And you can see we're all aware of the surge in alcohol consumption during the lockdowns. Uh, the online alcohol providers had massive increase in sales. 
and we are already in the first three quarters of uh, 2020 uh, seeing the data that in the 40 to 69 year olds we're seeing excessive deaths um, you know, an increase of 10 per 100,000 compared to what we'd expect from previous years because of increased alcohol consumption. And we know that this is a delayed effect. And so if we're seeing it already at this stage in the 2020 data, we will see even bigger range rises in the late 2020 data and into 2021 and potentially into 2022 as we see those deaths rise. So um, COVID lockdown liver is unfortunately a real syndrome that we've seen here all too frequently in nine worlds and we're seeing it at the national level uh, in UK data. So finally, Alcohol use is legal and firmly embedded in our society, and I have to accept it will remain so. The cardiovascular benefits, if real, are seen at very, very low consumption levels and probably only, if, only have benefit for middle-aged drinkers and probably only women. The health and other harms are major societal issues and are not confined to those who obviously misuse alcohol and are obviously addicted to it. It spreads much more widely across the apparently acceptable cultural norms for drinking at the moment. There is an effect that is disproportionate of those of lower socioeconomic status, and we need to explore why on apparently similar consumption levels, they seem to pick up much more harm and how inequalities are playing into that. While the relationship between population consumption and harm are not perfect, the maximum health improvements will be seen through shifting the whole consumption of alcohol rate downwards. Individuals may choose to live with the different levels of risk associated with their pattern and volume of consumption, but we must provide them with good information on those risks and we have to get better at putting out those government guidelines and publicizing them much more aggressively. And within those who choose to drink at higher levels, some of them are not choosing. Some of them have a disease and are addicted and we need to identify those people and offer them treatment so they are able to make a free choice around what they do in those things. Thank you for listening and I'm happy to take questions. John, thanks very much. I thought it was uh, interesting that the only person who dare interrupt you in your talk is yourself. <laughs> <laughs> um, so um, in the um, interesting parallels really between drink and smoking, you know, that's obviously the thing that uh, for us chess positions, you know, I, we ask so frequently, uh, you know, do you smoke or oh, not really? I, I'm a social smoker. What the hell does that mean? You know, uh, if you, a social smoker is a smoker and there's there's clearly no safe number of cigarettes to smoke in a day, a week or a year. Um, everyone is, is damaging. And it's, it's um, I have to admit, I've had the J-shaped curve in my head for a long time. And it's good to show such robust data that that's nonsense. And, and, and that actually that, that that doesn't stand up to scrutiny. Um, does anyone have any questions? I had a question in the um, in the uh, in the chat. Go for it, Tom. Um, the, Why don't you there's papers which appear in really quite senior general journals, which suggest that. Well, the conclusion was: if you're a 50 year old man, you've had a heart attack, and you don't drink, you should start, because the cardioprotective effects of alcohol. Now. You know, even you suggest that observational data show that that uh, drinking reduces uh, cardiovascular events. Is it not time we do a randomised trial of post MI patients, allowing them to continue to drink moderately or reduce their alcohol to see if it actually makes a difference? Because all the data you showed was observational. So I think such a trial would be difficult to organise, as you can appreciate, Tom, in terms of getting people to to stick to their alcohol level. Not really. Not, not if you sent them the alcohol, you get everyone to sign up. You've then got to stop them buying it in the shop and all the other... You do that, but largely you would reduce half of their alcohol down and you keep the other half normal. And while the group that have had a myocardial infarction, their, ri their risk of death from a future cardiovascular event is higher, their risk from death from stroke, which is also elevated after a myocardial infarction, will go up with alcohol. Their risk of developing a cancer will go up with alcohol. So it's not yeah. that them a, a pure benefit. If you were to think if you're thinking that as a drug, Tom, and you were putting it forward to the MHRA, it would get banned like triglitazone. Well, I, well, that's another issue. The fact is that the observational data has thrown up lots of wrong answers for lots of things in the past. And this is, even you admitted that it's likely to be biased. 
And we do need data beyond all reasonable doubt. And the only way to clarify that is to do a randomized trial of alcohol reduction. And that would be perfectly ethical. There are lots of little cans of mixed drinks in Tesco. You could easily double blind to do that. And I think that you, would, you could do a trial and we should do a trial. We probably owe it to society to do a trial. I think we yeah so I think there are it's not you know, it's only if we if you're, if you're treating this as a drug which I accept you know I'm, I'm accepting that we could treat this as a drug it's such a dirty drug and so and have so many other consequences for these patients I mean while we are picking a very high risk group and so you could the benefit would be greatest in this group because of that it's the other the other downsides of drinking alcohol I think over you know we're showing overall there is no survival benefit so if you improve, if you reduce their death rate from um, myocardial infarction over and above all of the other medications that you're already putting the patient on, um, is, there, is there good evidence that there is an additive benefit of alcohol on top of that from the observational data? If there was, mm -hmm. then I think that would be the, um, you know, in an optimally treated uh, post myocardial infarction survivor, is there an additional benefit from alcohol on top? If we could, so we should, so we that, should test the hypothesis. You can test that hypothesis from observational data if you see an effect. You can. And go and do the randomized control trial. You can't do it from observational data. It's always biased. You need to randomize. Anyway, you're obviously not convinced, but I think that's what we ought to do. Uh, we'll go on to um, Mudder. Hi, John. Long time no see. Um, thank you kindly. That was a fascinating oh, talk. Took me, back, took me back to those. Uh, uh, 20 years ago when I was your house officer and uh, it's really fascinating how things have moved on. Um, I get, my question, I, I always, I remember you, you telling me this and I, I really struggled with some of the patients when they had decompensated liver disease and on top of everything else that you mentioned, but when they were profoundly hypotensive. And I remember that I often struggled to sort of try and apply basic pathophysiology by using vasopressors, getting central line monitoring, et cetera. And you said to me, Muda, hepatic pathophysiology isn't in textbooks that you can rely on. Um, I'm just wondering what's changed in the sense of, we do often, we do sometimes, I mean, I'm, I'm not getting them, of course, frequently because I'm based in Perth at the moment. Um, but there are, when they're hypotensive in that setting and they're for level two, level three care, what, what do you suggest you sort of approach um, for them? Thanks. So in, in that situation, so in that situation, the main thing that's driving their hypertension is a vasodilatation of the splanchnic circulation. So their ability to auto-regulate that circulation is lost, and so they are they think they've eaten a massive steak dinner with huge amounts of chips, and so they are their gut blood flow is huge. And so trying to selectively shut down the gut blood flow is one thing. Making sure they're adequately filled in the first instance with because they often have low albumin, so their intravascular space will be depleted. So filling that optimally with colloid, um, preferably ALBA, and then constricting them with vasopressin or terlipressin, um, which there are more vasopressin, arginine vasopressin receptors within the gut circulation than in other gut other circulations. And so stimulating that will have a pr more profound vasoconstrictive effect on the gut and you effectively auto transfuse the rest of the circulation. And that's probably the best first stage. Backing that up with noradrenaline, et cetera, is a, a second stage. But by the time you get to that stage, you're on a pretty sticky wicket. Yeah. Sort of trying to bridge into transplant, you have to start to review where you're going to yeah. get. That's yeah. Yeah. A stage approach. Yeah. Okay. So it's, it's, it's much the same. Fill them up, vasopressin, and then once they get to the adrenaline, that you, you, you're sort of stuck and needing to escalate. Yeah. So that's good. Thanks. Yeah. And patient well, sepsis is the major driving thing. We'll have. Uh, more of a response to noradrenaline. John, but perhaps just pushing on for that, I'll take uh, Chair's privilege to butt in here. Um, quite a lot of um, therapeutic nihilism about people with ALD and intensive care, level three. Um, um, what's your, I mean, we, we talk sometimes about it's their first presentation, so they'll do pretty well. Some of my ICU colleagues and my experience in critical care is that they don't tend, it's, it's hard to predict who's gonna do well What's your just general thoughts about ICU for people with, I, with ALD? So I think um, so that you know, it's it's what's caused the decompensation and how fixable that is. And so if this is an acute on chronic liver failure, while their short-term mortality is high, um, 
by optimizing their care, you'll improve their outcome. Their outcomes are still going to be amongst the worst for ICU pay, for ICUs in general. So, you know, it's a, it's that they are the sickest patients ICUs are going to have to deal with. If they're in stage liver disease, then they will do less well. If they, they if they have completely run out and don't have the regenerative capacity, they will do less well. The more organ failures they have, the less well they will do. Um, and so, and so it's, it's balancing those factors. And so the Clifford score, et cetera, will give us some better ideas about what we're doing. I think we are getting a better understanding of the inflammatory pathophysiology that's going on here, and we will have tools to manipulate it more. I think from coming back to this idea of their first time, if we can get them to survive their first 30 days and they stop drinking, their long term survival is excellent. And that's the point. I think if the, if they are if they've had multiple shoutings at, by my, my, myself and my colleagues from the end of the bed to stop drinking and they've had interaction with our colleagues in addiction psychiatry and they are still drinking, then their pro long term prognosis is very poor. And if they decompensate. So the first time idea is that they haven't had most people haven't had that interaction with alcohol addiction services or advice to stop. Most of the people we see presenting for that first time have been heavy social drinkers with a degree of dependency, but they haven't had the opportunity, they haven't had the chance to be told to stop. So that first time thing is that point, if you can get them over their initial mortality, but their initial mortality is high, much better than it was. And we know that by optimizing their care, we give them the best chance, but it's a, a two way conversation. And clearly if they have also other multiple morbidities, then it becomes, um, less likely that we're going to get a survival advantage in the, the discussion with ICU. And so I think that we are, you know, it needs to be a discussion on an individual case basis. Um, Kevin has asked a follow-up question to that, um, which is what sort of services and or uptake by patients happen through alcohol related issues and alcohol services? So is there a good uptake? What's the success rate of, um, or is it, um, is it just shouting at a wall? So um, in terms of our first admissions, about 50% of them stop and stay stopped, and their five-year survival is good. 50% continue to, to drink, and they don't have a five-year survival. Um, all of them, are the last time we ordered it, all of them were dead by three years. And so it is that first stopping and starting. Um, alcohol services across Tayside, I know Roberto's on the call, um, are patchy. People are, we have a statutory providing sector that are focused on um, recovery and um, moving away from addictions. For some of our patients, the whole alcohol is so embedded in their social circumstances and life, etc., that we need to think about more of a harm reduction approach. We're putting together a project to try and look at a more integrated care package going up with copying what's happening in England uh, with the alcohol care team. So at the moment, you've got a chore, you, you, you have the physical out liver care team and you have the alcohol care team and the patient can choose between the two and the idea is to wrap those two teams into one the patient can't get away from the physical team because they keep coming back to hospital if they don't play ball with the physical team to solve their acute problems and if the addiction so addictions approach is embedded in that in a single worker then the patient doesn't get both and that's what we need to have we need to have better integration between those two services and that's something that if I come back in a five years time and give you my 30 year review, I'll hopefully be telling you what a huge success that was. Okay, thanks very much. That's great. Uh, we're running out of time. So perhaps uh, there's no more questions on the chat. So we'll bring things to a conclusion. Uh, thanks so much, John. Fantastic talk. Really, uh, really uh, cutting edge stuff in you know, a state of the nation. Really, really enjoyed that. And uh, uh, I think uh, we all got a lot out of that. Um, if you joined halfway through or you want to watch that again, then the video will be uploaded to our YouTube channel in due course once I've, uh, once I've uh, done a wee bit of editing. Um, you can watch all of our previous Grand Rounds on the same YouTube channel. Remember to like and subscribe and uh, you can see Grand Rounds back to 2015. Uh, next week, Paul Newey from Endocrinology is going to speak about, I'm not sure what because he's not giving me a title, but uh, Paul's interest is in, uh, is in tumours. Um, pancreatic tumours particularly, so that may well be what he's talking about, but I should hopefully have more information for you with the email next week. Um, uh, so thanks so much for joining. Uh, thanks again to John, and I'll see you again next week. Thanks very much. <laughs>